Let's bring in our featured guest of the morning. He's David Burroughs, Chief Investment Officer and Chairman at Barometer Capital Management. David, thanks a lot for joining us. Great to be here. Uh, any quick thoughts on Couchetard and what looks like a very ambitious plan to buy the owner of 7-Eleven? You know, th this has been a company that we've owned over time. We don't own it currently because in the last couple of quarters, the, the earnings growth was slowing. Uh, this really, if they can get this done, gives them a great opportunity. I mean, they have shown over and over again that they're good at integrating acquisitions. Um, obviously, lots of question marks. This is going to be a competitive auction, uh, so others will come in. But realistically, if they were to take a run at this, they probably could be accretive, you know, 50, 60 percent in wow. their earnings. Wow. So there's, this, this would make it probably a company that we would need to own. Uh, because this would be right in their wheelhouse. Okay, uh, let's move on to your thoughts on the markets. Uh, we are getting ever closer to a, a very much expected Fed rate cut in the middle of September. We're about a month away, and your view is that this will begin a, or has begun a, a liquidity cycle. What does that mean, and what does it mean to markets? Well, you know, look, it, it highlights the dichotomy. People get focused on economic data and make decisions based on it. But you have to remember the market is not looking at the data today. It's looking at where they think the data is going to be in nine months. Mm -hmm. and, and the single biggest contributor to asset prices is liquidity. We've been through two years of a global tightening cycle. June was the first month that we hadn't have any tightening. And outside of Japan last month, again in July. So uh, we're going to get a cut in September. Uh, over the period of June and July, there was a little bit of mixed economic data. That caused $300 billion of de-risking in markets from hedge funds and professional investors. So that money went to the sidelines. Now, when we got that spike in volatility two weeks ago, it was similar to the spike in volatility in 2020 during the COVID sell-off. But in the case of 2020 or in the case of 2015 or the case of 2008, it took months and months for volatility to come down. It came right back down over the course of a week, and that speaks to liquidity. So we've got um, about $7 trillion U.S. in money market funds, some of which can be deployed. We've got uh, rate cuts that will start in September in the U.S., We've got a ton of that 300 billion that came out of the market now realizing there's less chance of a hard landing than they thought. Yeah. Uh, and, and so to give you an idea, in the next week, if we get a flat market, there's like $60 billion worth of buying. If we get an up market, there's probably uh, $75 billion worth of buying. 25 billion in the US and the rest of the, rest of the world. Even if there's a down tape over the next week, Unless it's really bad, you're going to get 35 billion of buying. You know, over the next month, there's like 150 billion dollars can come into the market. Now, moving from that, we're finishing the earnings period in the U.S. and you've got the share buybacks coming. So this next two months is the second biggest two months of the year for share buybacks. Something like 21 percent of buybacks, and we have record announced buybacks. So there's a lot of money that is looking for a home. And, and how much of it's going into the stock market, do you think? Well, you know, this money can go to investment-grade bonds. It can go to stocks. I think a lot of it's going to the stock market. What's more interesting is that a lot of it's going to global stocks. And that's a change. You know, the U.S. dollar has started to weaken versus the pound, versus the euro, yeah. versus the yen. And that often tells us there is appetite for risk in other markets. And so while the buying has been very concentrated in the U.S. over the last couple of years, we are seeing a real shift in leadership. You know, Japan is behaving really well, even with that wobble. Uh, India looks very good. Some Latin American countries look really good. And, and they are less crowded trades and maybe better risk reward from a valuation perspective. And are you making portfolio choices in step with that view? We have, over the course of this year, been buying global stocks ex North America. We also have bought more Canadian stocks because the, com the, the, the common factor is that for global stocks and for Canada, financials make up a bigger part of the market, industrials make up a bigger part of the market, materials and energy make up a bigger part of the markets. And so the Canadian market has started to outperform as well. And again, it's under owned. So 
lots of opportunities right now. Well, you mentioned Japan. That was a, a big, big story in 2023 and for most of 2024, and then it really fell out of bed earlier this month when markets globally uh, uh, came off and it has not yet come close to regaining its high. What, what you, what, what's your view on Japanese stocks? So what happened was for a decade, we know that Japanese investors sold yen to buy other currencies to get a carry return on that investment. And when the Japanese yen started to rise, it happened in the middle of the night. So when somebody has to be a seller, they sell what they can sell, and they sold Japan. Now, almost just as quickly, the buying has come back there, on top of which people like Warren Buffett stepped in to do a bond deal because he thought, here's a great opportunity to buy Japanese stocks. They've only just exited you know, a 30-year bear market. Yeah. Uh, and so some of the changes that are taking place from a regulatory perspective actually help this Kushkar deal, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. They're liberalizing yeah. the ability to buy Japanese companies. Uh, and we think that some of these changes are very market friendly.